Welcome to Support Life, a program focusing on current social issues from a life-affirming perspective. I'm Gavin Bolsh and my guest is Selenia Arapoglu from the Australian Christian Political Party. Welcome. Thank you. We, we had a nice little chat out in the sun we today. Did. We did. a beautiful did. day. Getting our vitamin D. Yeah, we did. I've yeah. got my extra 10 minutes that the doctor said I had to have. <laughs> I trust lots of other Australians are doing the right Absolutely, thing. Absolutely, yeah. All right, now I'm going to delve into a little bit of your past and and I was fascinated by the fact that um, uh, you were a goth. Well, yeah, sort of. Sort of. I want to be. I want to be, okay. <laughs> yeah. tell, me, tell me about that. Yeah, it was just um, a time in my life as a teenager where I felt... Uh, a drawn to a certain lifestyle that was alternative Mm -hmm. that was defining I suppose we're looking I suppose when I look back I was looking for a point of difference but there was a genuine interest in issues of what lies beneath um, what are the deeper sort of issues and and along with that came an interest in the occult eastern mysticism and I was, being a very sensitive person, I was very introspective. So, you know, just looking deeper and deeper into this, what I felt was an abyss. Um, so along with that, sort of the image came. It was very natural mm-hmm. to sort of be dark, always dark, <laughs> always the heavy eyeliner. And, and it wasn't necessarily conscious. It just sort of followed. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that um, search was probably playing into your identity. Who are you? Oh, yeah, I think it would had everything to do with it. I mean, not at the time, I couldn't understand that, but um, it began quite early for me, that awakening of what is this all about? Is there a God? All of those sort of defining issues uh, where life begins, and it began at um, 10, but I didn't find the answer. I felt that it was I was quite patronised for asking them at a young age mm. um, and almost ignored Um, and it did something inside of me. After a while, the search stopped, and I just felt that my expression was sort of a rebellion, Mm. Um, and particularly sort of image, how I managed my image. And for me, it was all important. It was all consuming, um, and it just progressively got darker and darker, Mm. and, and, and very ironically, Emotionally, I became I began to disconnect from people. So the ones that I was looking for answers and affection, eventually, I disconnected. Mm. So mm. adolescence is a pretty powerful kind of life experience. Absolutely. And the search is on for maybe many watching the show tonight. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. think um, in that identity search, uh, I would encourage the audience to to ask questions and to delve and to look and to mm. to seek. Mm. because they mm. will find um, light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, and and not necessarily where you think you're going to find it. So uh, I think it's quite normal and natural for kids to sort of uh, start to want to find their own self-expression mm-hmm. and sort of s- cut the ties with that dependency. Um, but it's not always done in this fluid, sort of healthy way, and it can be quite painful. Yes. Um, but certainly, you know, that's that's normal and healthy mm. and whatever else. But for many of us, as was my upbringing, there were emotional, dysfunctional issues, um, whatever else. So it became quite a very quick succession of steps that were becoming more and more dangerous and risky mm. and, and dark. Yes. And it, yeah, that's, yeah. So um, you had wonderful, hardworking parents. Absolutely. Both of them were, yeah. But again, their own issues um, of how they sort of functioned within this migrant experience of coming from villages in Greece and then coming to, you know, it was all about making it and establishing something. And they certainly did. Um, But they weren't versed enough and had, you know, what that meant for their children in terms of emotional stability because as everyone else, they were just trying to survive. Yes. And they hadn't worked out all their issues because from Greece they were just wanting to get out of poverty. So there was, a again for them, a disconnect of how it all works and all, how it all comes together. And the societal, um, uh, I suppose, expectation was just you work, you have a family, 
and you just keep doing that until you drop dead. Mm. Um, so for the children that are sort of halfway between all that, coming into an Australian culture and and going through an education system that's quite different to what they experienced or hardly anything of what they'd experienced, all these sort of struggles come in mm. um, and it doesn't always go smoothly. Yeah. I think the the mix of uh, being torn between two cultures, parents adjusting to a new culture, um, yeah. create these things. And we do have to say to one another that our parents aren't perfect and we're not perfect. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And it's I think it's very hard to figure out as a child because they are the significant people in your yes. life. So you're looking for the answers from them. And it is quite liberating to get to that stage when you work through all that mess to realise that they were just people that were trying to figure it out and did it very imperfectly. Mm. And I think for me it came a lot later in my adulthood, which I was deeply able to empathise with their own struggles Mm -hmm. and to forgive them. Yes. So you have um, two children of your own? Two children, 15 and 11. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting stage. Right. That's right. And all of those mm. wonderful years uh, w- with your goth identity mm. um, has really informed you and helped you to raise two teenagers. Ah, uh, yeah. So one's not quite a teenager, but um, I think what what it's done is is that it's it's given me a real sense that there are quite defining moments in someone's development. And those years, uh, although they're they're so small in terms of overall how long we might live on this earth, they really do take a long time if they're done very imperfectly. um, They really do take a long time to sort of unpack mentally and emotionally and come through it and sort of understand what it was all about, who am I? Mm. Um, So I think with my kids, I can draw on that and think, well, th- that was a really tough period. Mm. Uh, such a short, intense time, but it just did so much in shaping me. Yes. Um, and I actually really enjoy understanding and seeing their development and oh, how good. I can input yes. into that um, in a way that doesn't suffocate them, but is empathetic towards all the issues that they might be trying to sort of struggle with. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll come back in, in a moment and look at another defining moment in your life. You're watching Support Life and we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Support Life. I'm Gavin Bolch and my guest is uh, Eleni Arapoglu from the Australian Christians Political Party. Now, we were talking about defining moments and um, uh, you've come through um, a slightly dark stage and one of your defining moments now is you're standing for politics. That's right, yeah. Okay, who with? Australian Christians. Good. Uh, I'm the candidate for the seat of Bulleen. Oh, wonderful, Mm -hmm. okay. And um, there must have been a process to get to this point. Well, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't something I envisaged, to be honest. I didn't go seeking it. And up till late last year, I didn't even know Australian Christians existed. Um, but certainly, I think the process of me coming to the point where I said yes to candidacy was sort of coinciding with a sense of being sort of grounded in my own identity. Um, and that would have to do primarily with my Christian identity and those sort of bigger elements of who am I. Um, and I don't think you can do that. I mean, Vicky of, often, uh, the director, jokes that um, we've been schooled in rejection, so we're perfect for, for politics. And I think in, a case, in our case it is true. Um, but you have to come to the point where you're, where you're comfortable and secure with who you are in order to be able to sort of go into that bigger picture arena and stand against all those different views and, and clashes and, and whatever else. Otherwise, uh, you crumble. Yeah. So finding your identity was important and mm-hmm. finding um, issues to fight for, stand for, is yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. What are the three key uh, kingpins to your 
standing with the Australian Christians? Mm. I think for, for me, the sort of pivotal issues that really uh, intrigue me is what, what is freedom? Because I think how we define freedom really impacts the political space. And when we talk about it, we sort of throw them around as sort of just uh, terms that are very common and whatever else. But how a Christian, for instance, understands freedom would be very different to what a communist socialist understands freedom. And they have to be defined. And so my passion is to understand how the, under, the Christian view of freedom has impacted governance. Uh, and it's been positive through and through. Um, so, it, And it dates back millennia. People sort of only take it from Australian's constitution or the founding fathers of America. But it de- dates back to the Magna Carta of 1215. And it was all that tension of, you know, um, personhood. Again, identity, imago Dei the identity of God within man and what that meant for uh, equality in the eyes of God, those deep theological issues then impacted the public space and from the public space and people crying out for personal rights, which were linked in to divine law, that came into governance and sort of filled, you know, millennia's worth of moral law trolled by by jury, 12 jurors, the 12 apostles, you know, th- that's just part of our, our narrative. And I feel that it needs to be recaptured and retold to a new generation. So the context is put right. Um, and, hmm. There we are. Okay, so let's, let's come back to perhaps the difference between me taking the moral high ground on something and uh, taking um, a stand with a virtuous uh, underpinning. What? Why is virtue so important? Well, again, it's it's this tension between what freedom really means and what is now in the public discourse as a right. Um, freedom, as you know, the Christian worldview started to understand it was the freedom to practice virtue. So it was a goodness that became sort of internalized and spread out towards other people. So the view that we have to look out for the vulnerable and the least able to look after themselves springs from that freedom to practice virtue. Um, The rights issue is a sort of a a difficult one because rights become confused with a sense of entitlement, Mm -hmm. um, which I think are not synonymous with freedom. Um, So taking a moral high ground really can come across quite legalistic Mm -hmm and very sort of, um, I suppose, suffocating, whereas freedom that springs from that inner virtue that you want to see other people flourish and you want to protect the most vulnerable is liberating. So that's that's the distinction that I make. Mm. So you've used the word liberating, uh, the mm-hmm. word liberty here. Mm-hmm. Um, under other forms of uh, government, maybe communism or, or, mm-hmm. or extreme forms of socialism, mm-hmm. um, liberty doesn't exist, does it? Not, not in the way that we've understood it in the Christian context, because it's coerced. So they're telling you this is good for you and that's the line that you need to take. Um, and it really becomes the collectivist idea that in, freedom only exists in a community. That's how freedom is, in, is expressed. And there are, obviously there are elements of truth there. But the Christian worldview is it begins in the inner person, in the image of the personhood of how we define ourselves and spreads out. Yes. Um, and I think they're very, I mean, they're, they're sometimes difficult to distinguish, um, but it's a distinguishing feature that needs to be told and understood in order to make that really sort of that choice that we're going to make in politics really understood with voters. Mm. Yeah. So those who um, are listening into this this discussion, mm. uh, we're encouraging them to go out and think and mm-hmm. do their homework and, and really grasp what freedom and liberty might mean for them. Absolutely. All right. Well, you're watching Support Life and we'll be back after the break. Welcome 
Welcome back to Support Life. I'm Gavin Bolch and my guest is Alini Arapoglu from the Australian Christians Political Party. We've had an interesting journey and um, we might just have a look at um, personhood for a minute. Mm -hmm. So where do we go with such a word? Yeah, well, it's got deep roots in terms of the little that I know in terms of its philosophical outworkings. Um, and it oh, dates back millennia, but we're looking at Aristotle and they're sort of trying to understand what is a person, who is it, and that, that's intrinsically linked to the value that they gave them. Mm. So Aristotle, I think, in politics looked at personhood as, you know, the male being the dominant person who had all the qualities of personhood, and then you go down the chain and you see that, you know, children, women, and then barbarians um, were just, it just got worse and worse. So uh, they just didn't, I think he called it the deliberate faculty. So how they were imbued with this de deliberate faculty meant they sort of had more rights or less rights. So up the top was a male, Greek, and then you had the women that were under his authority had less. Uh, children, because they were so immature, less so. Um, and barbarians were good mm. enough only for enslavement. Mm. Um, and of course that, you know, that had all political consequences as well. And then you have the Romans, of course, with their law of tables the, um, that really uh, had the very same sort of outworking of what personhood meant. And it was the elitist aristocracy that had the greatest value and therefore women, children, disabled, less and less so, uh, almost akin to animals. Mm. So, so what was... Um enshrined about uh, children? Were they subject to death early? Yeah, in one of, I think it was um, one of the tables in the Roman, uh, in the Roman law, they were actually told to, to kill people, uh, children born with disabilities. Um, their personhood was basically non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't seen as of any value whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So in, in history, Jesus Christ challenged the values of personhood, did he not? Absolutely. And there were two ways. Um, imago Dei, as we talked about, which is the image of God and, and being made in the image of God. And of course, that had a Jewish context as well. They were always sort of grappling with that very deep theological idea. But then the incarnation was one more above that. So this is now God incarnate in, in the image, God's image now, also in the image of man and taking on our suffering, our likeness. And so we have, you know, this very powerful imagery of that intimacy of creation and the value that God puts on man and here all humanity, I should say. Um, and this is where then obviously the thinking of Paul that says there is neither Greek nor Jew nor barbarian nor free nor slave nor woman or child because in the image of God we're all imbued with that value that is intrinsic simply because he made us. Mm. And that's powerful. Mm. Well, that moves us into the audience watching who's thinking about voting with the selection mm. coming up, that, mm -hmm. that we're saying to them their vote is very important, uh, mm -hmm. that, that they are this this person that has uh, God's image, in a sense, stamped on them, whether they realise it or not. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a value now coming out. They mm -hmm. can vote. Mm -hmm. Why are we encouraging them to look at the minor parties? Well, I think what we've seen in the past few years is that there's that sense that the major parties, because it is a representative democracy, so you're just voting for major parties and you don't have a say in the sort of like the intricacies of policy so once they get up there they've given certain promises then you know reality hits in and you see the sort of outworkings of the in the political space and people are feeling more and more that they're really only their only choice is two representative parties they get in there you know there's a bit of sort of uh, backroom dealing and they're left with sort of not really a sense that their values or what they really voted for are being sort of put on the uh, right up the top of the list. Minorities, because they're not, I suppose, um, as well entrenched into the political big parties, are more sort of in line with what 
people on a grassroots level are vying for. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why you're seeing such a massive expansion of them, I think, that various groups with all their needs are saying, well, actually, my voice needs to get heard on these issues. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's been a massive, I suppose, um, building up of minorities. Yeah. So what would you encourage any young adult uh, watching uh, to consider? Mm. I, I just think look at the websites, look at uh, what it is at their core, because uh, values are important. Look at their, their position in terms of what they value in terms of life, in terms of the historical contexts of their, of their political party. Um, what does it mean? What, are the, what is the outcome they're trying to get to in terms of the freedom? Is there a, a, is there a, a, a quenching of that freedom where you're told that this is the line that it's going to take regardless of what you do? Or is there sort of a liberation to talk about and expand on this public discourse of where we're going, where these values are leading us? Um, I'd encourage them to think very deeply and also to, to understand that minorities are not insignificant that even if they don't get in uh, through preferential voting, they're able to make whoever's voted for them count towards parties that sort of have a similar view. So they're not wasted, whatever they decide. Mm. Mm. Okay. So we're asking um, the audience to find some space away from white noise and, and to give due consideration uh, for the importance of this vote that they have. Absolutely. And yeah. the, the platform that you're on is? Life, Family and Freedom. Okay, life, why? Because life and what we consider to be, um, I think, defining where we, you know, I mean, we there's sort of a, being th- bantered around a bit, but there is, so, in the society, I suppose, what we consider valuable is promoting a culture that breeds life. And more and more we're finding a culture that's sort of diminishing that, especially to those who are vulnerable. Mm. So life a meaning that even the smallest life, the most fragile life, has meaning and value. And a compassionate society will always look of how to protect Mm -hmm. and give dignity to life, Mm -hmm. regardless of what stage you're at. Um, teenagehood, beginning, end, that's what life is. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, h- here we are in a country that uh, extols freedom mm-hmm. and um, we do have free will. So uh, we encourage those listening to consider all that we've said. Absolutely. You've been watching Support Life and that's all for our program today. Join us again next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.